Who's next? Grace and peace to you. I'm Pastor Tony. Today we're going to talk about faith. And not just a little faith, but a lot of faith. What does it take to have faith? What's the difference between thinking you have faith and really having faith? So we're in the Way Forward sermon series. Way Forward is connecting also with the capital campaign. Uh, we believe in what God is doing here at Wesley Chapel. We have faith in that, and we are trusting that God is at work in our lives, in our church, and through us in our community. So we're going to look at a, a gentleman who had faith, put his faith in Jesus, from Matthew chapter 8. It's going to be uh, on the screen, and I invite you to read with me. When Jesus had entered Capernaum, the centurion came to him, asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. But just say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am the man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes. I tell this one, come, and he comes. I tell my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, Truly I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such a great faith. This is the word of God for you, for me, and for all people, and for that we say, thanks be to God. So today we're going to talk about faith and belief and the difference and a little bit about that. And so uh, I'm going to use a stool. This stool is going to illustrate kind of where you might be on the, what we call the discipleship pathway. Where are you in your journey of faith? And we've identified five different categories, and that doesn't mean it's the only categories. There may be more, but it's just five that we try to help explain uh, the journey of faith. And we use this discipleship pathway to try to identify where, where I am, where you are. It's not used as a tool to judge one another to say, oh, I know where you are in your journey of faith. You're way behind or you're way ahead. It's a tool to say, where am I on my journey of faith? And so we'll use the tool as an illustration to explain faith in Jesus. And so we start with what we call the seeker. The seeker is someone just looking for a stool. All right? Looking for a stool, looking for a stool. They might find a stool, but it may not be the Jesus stool. It might be a different stool. But they're looking for a stool. They're looking for meaning. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for something to put their faith in or someone to put their faith in. So when you find a stool, then you become an explorer. Now you see the stool, you found the stool, you've been seeking, but however, you're not so sure that's the stool you want to sit on. You, uh, you look at it, you might even pick it up and examine it, make sure there's all the bolts and screws are in it, the pan is in it, so it seems sturdy enough. You might even uh, test it out, we'll just put a little weight here, see if uh, it a hold a little weight there. So you are exploring, is this stool a stool for me to put my face in? And then, um, depending on how you like to explore, how much research you like to do, perhaps uh, you'll even uh, see how it does with some other things on it. All right. So it will hold the rock. So you're starting to think maybe that is something that I can sit on. And you may even come to a point where you've seen other people, other lives, who put their faith in Jesus. And you might think, they put their faith in Jesus, it's working for them. Maybe this is something that I can do. And, and you might even come to the point where you believe that stool can hold my weight. How many of you believe that stool can hold my weight? All right, about eight of you. What are you saying? I'm fat? What's going on here? All right. Well, the main thing is, do I believe that stool can hold my weight? And I'm thinking, I believe that stool can hold my weight. So I'm going to get the rock off. It's really not heavy at all. So, 
we'll put the rock down. Now there's a difference between believing and following Jesus Christ. There's a difference between believing and having faith. And some of us get all that mixed up. We think just because we believe, we have faith. But that's not necessarily true. I haven't demonstrated faith in this tool until I do what? Sit on it. For those of you from Happy Days. So, I began to put my faith in this tool. And maybe I'm not, maybe in my faith is, you know, I'm getting a little bit, I'm testing it still. Okay. I'm going to put my faith in a stool, but maybe I'm not completely sold on it. So I'll, uh, I'll just one cheek it here. There we go. One cheek it. I don't still have to put my full weight on a stool, but I'm putting some of my weight on the stool. Got my feet on the ground. I'm leaning forward. So uh, it seems to be doing okay. So I'll, I'll like, get the back half there. All right. And uh, I'm getting my weight on the stool a little bit more. And eventually, I'm putting my faith in the stool, but I still haven't put my whole faith in the stool. You see, and I might even walk away from it and say, yeah, I have faith. And we do that with Jesus. We do that with Jesus. We say, okay, I'm trying to figure out if Jesus is the real thing. Trying to figure out if there is a God. And you might come to belief, yes, I believe there's a God. You might come to belief that Jesus is the Son of God. You might believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins. You might believe that Jesus was resurrected on the third day. You might even be coming to church. You might even call yourself a believer. You might call yourself a Christian. But really, you haven't put your full weight on Jesus yet. Matter of fact, there might be a few other stools in your life. So, so you come one cheek it here on Sunday morning. Yeah, I have faith in Jesus. You get your one hour, maybe two if you go to Sunday school, or maybe three if you go to the dinner in a little bit. They have more nice cream. They have pork sandwiches and all kinds of good stuff. You might be there for three hours, and then on Monday, you, you're back on your old stool. Do you believe in Jesus? Oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Do you have faith in Jesus? Yeah, a couple hours a week. So there is a, there's a difference, and, and Jesus shows us that difference, and it's demonstrated over and over again in the New Testament. There are people who are following Jesus for the purpose of trying to be like Jesus. There are people who are following Jesus because they trust in Jesus. And there are some, Jesus, there are some people that are kind of following Jesus around and trying to figure out if Jesus is the real deal. Maybe seeing if Jesus has performed a miracle for them. Maybe they go to Jesus in a time of need to see if this Jesus is really going to work out. But there comes a point for us to be a disciple of Jesus Christ when we have to put our full weight, our full trust in Him. And when we do that, it's more than a one seeker, it's more than a two seeker, it's getting your feet off the ground and completely relying on Jesus. Now this is faith. I have faith. I demonstrated that faith by putting my full weight on the stool. So in the first century, disciple rabbi relationship, we need to understand that I've explained it before, but it's never hard to explain it again. In the first century rabbi disciple relationship, when Jesus said, Follow me, he was saying more than do you believe in me? He was saying more than just follow me around. It was an invitation into a relationship. So Jesus was inviting people into a relationship, and that relationship was based on trust. And he was asking these people who were accepting the invitation and following him as disciples to trust him fully in everything. And these, these folks, uh, they trusted him, and it was a process, and wherever you are on that spectrum, and, and this is not to be judgment on where anyone is, this is just helping you identify where you might be. Because we can say, oh, I trust him fully, but then there are times when we might go back to some old ways. 
There might be some times when we really don't trust Him fully. There might be, there might be times when if we're really honest with Himself, trusting Him fully to us means we're not seeking it, but we're putting most of our weight. We're relying on our own strength, we're relying on our own finances, we're relying on our own abilities, we're relying on things from the past to get us through whatever it is we need to get through. But Jesus wants us to put our full trust in Him. Now, I came up with this illustration. It's not my illustration. I was listening to a missionary. Twenty years ago, I was listening to a missionary with a, a group called Wycliffe. Wycliffe, anybody heard of Wycliffe? Wycliffe translates the Bible into the languages of people who do not have a Bible. So there are, there are a whole bunch of folks in the world that do not have a Bible that they can read. It's not in their language. And so I was listening to this um, this local Bible translator, and he was translating the Bible in a certain language, and what they do is they go down, they live with the people, they learn the language, uh, they learn the, the customs, they learn everything, and they begin to translate it as they live with the people. And so he's been living with the people, and he came to the word faith. Uh, in Greek, it's pissed off, but in, it's, it's faith that we translate it into the English word, and he realized there was no word in this community for the word faith. They did not have a word that we would define as faith, that we would call faith. They did not have that word. And so he didn't know what to put. What do I put for faith in this language that does not have a word for faith? And so he had to pass that by. He kept translating and tried to figure out the culture and who the people were and get to know them and talk to them. And then he found the word. They had a word in the language called to put your full weight upon. And that's the word he used. And that had an effect on me hearing that missionary. It had an effect on how I viewed faith from that point on. Because if I was real honest when I heard that missionary, I had a lot more faith in my abilities than I had in God. And I had to realize that I had to put all my faith, all my trust, all my hopes, all my cares, everything on Jesus. Put my full weight on Jesus. So, let's see how that works out in a lot of different ways. So, this is our stool. I'm going to use another illustration. And the illustration is um, called marriage. I happen to be married. Uh, 30 years to my wife, Rhonda. She's a beautiful lady. I love her very much. Um, but, you know, when you start dating someone, you start to get to know them. And they didn't have language back then as define the relationship. Now we've got all the define the relationship. How do you define the relationship? And that's all good stuff, but you know, we didn't think in those terms way back then. And so uh, I knew I was serious. When she asked me this question, nah, let me take that back. I don't think so. I, it wasn't serious. I just knew things were going in a direction that I had never had before. She said, uh, "I want to know how many girlfriends you've had before me, and how long you were with them, and what were their names." <laughs> yeah. I'm like, wow, this is, uh, you know, now I've got to decide that I want to even answer this question. Or I just leave it alone. And I have to admit, it's just a, a long conversation. All right? Uh, I had my first girlfriend when I was 12 and 6th grade. We had hands on the bus. You know, it was like, it was like a real thing. Right? I was really in love. And it really didn't last. And so, you know, over the course of uh, the next eight years when I met Rhonda, I was 20, and she wasn't know how many girlfriends I had. What were the names and how long it was? So it took a while. And uh, the answer is 12. I had 12. So I went through each of them and told them who they were and what they did and how long the relationship lasted. And I, I didn't get any kind of reaction. I had no idea if she was like, oh, good, it's only 12, or oh, my gosh, it's 12. I had no idea. I couldn't, I couldn't read her at all as I'm having this conversation. But, uh, but that part was over. I, I laid my life in front of her. I had my girlfriend. And then I went to bed that night, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I forgot, too. 
And so, uh, so I had to I had to tell her. I mean, I, I told her as early as I could. The next day, I said, I said, Amanda, Amanda, I, I got to tell you, it's not well. It's fourteen. I got a few more. And I told her who, 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 who she was. And uh, to be quite honest, I just quit thinking about it after that because I didn't want to think of anybody else. Um, so they're fourteen. So uh, evidently the, the answer went out okay, and we dated, and we got engaged, and then we planned the marriage, and then we, we stood before the church and the pastor and the people, and we said a wedding vows. Now, I know a lot of people like to write their own wedding vows. I didn't know that was a thing. You know, I, could, I didn't know. So, uh, so we just had these basic wedding vows. And uh, even if I was going to write my wedding vows, I wouldn't have a clue what to write. And it's probably a good thing I, I didn't, because I want to share with you what I was thinking when I was sending my wedding down. Huh? I was okay for the, the have and the hope, for better, for worse, for richer, for poor, and sickness and health. But then that next line, remember what it is? The biggest part really good me. There's one line between. For thanking all others. I was in front of the church. Let's see, I was on this side. She's on this side. I was in front of the church, standing in my hall, forsaking our lovers. It was down on me. I can't have any more girlfriends. This is it. That's it. Now, there, there is a piece of me. Yeah, and maybe not a little bit. But kind of always was looking for the escape clause. I don't know about you. When I go to a movie theater, I like to sit where I know where the exit is. All right? And maybe you're like that when you come to church. Just let me sit close to you and sit. the pastor starts sitting or something. So, so, like, I'm thinking, oh my gosh. Now, if I would have written my own vows, it might have been something like this. I'm pushing first in my life. And if things don't go well, I'll talk about the world. It's very good for me. That's what I would have written. That doesn't make a lot more sense to me. You know, it just doesn't work out. It's all bad. But I got the vibe. And then it got to the top, and then I wrote it. And then there's one more piece that I got. I don't even remember what the pastor said. I was just, I was like, oh my gosh, this is over. This is it. This is not it. But some of us approach a relationship with the one true God with the desire to fall back on a rabbit. Just in case it doesn't work out with God. Just in case it doesn't work out with Jesus. You know what? Just in case these people are kind of followers of Christ, just in case they're real weird, I, I, okay, I'll, I'll, I believe, I'm going to speak it here, but I'm going to keep looking back because I might want to go back to that other school that I came from before I came to Jesus. And so God anticipated that. God anticipated that all the way back in Exodus when Moses went up on the mountain. God gave him a, what we call a Ten Commandments, but it's really a relationship pact. It's, it's really the vows of a relationship with God. And the very first vow is, Thou shalt have now the gods before me. Now, we've interpreted that many times as we're going to put God first in our life. All right, isn't that a good thing? Let's put God first in our lives. Now, how does that translate when I do my wedding vows? Rhonda, I'm going to put you first in my life. Now, I'm going to keep these other 14 girlfriends that I have, but you're the one and only for me. And that's how we approach our relationship with Jesus. Oh, Jesus, you're first in my life, and here's a long list of these other things that I rely on, too. These are important to me, too. I'm going to rely on them every once in a while, because sometimes they may not work out. Maybe I'll come back here and I'll sit on this show. Just, just, Jesus, I'll just want to seek it on this one, too, just to tell you that I'm not fully trusting in this. But now, when, when, when Moses came down with those commandments, it's about a relationship with God. Now, if you want a relationship with God, this is what this relationship looks like. You shall have no other God before me. It doesn't mean putting God first, the creator of the universe, and then having these other gods in line, 12, 13, 14. It's about God being the one and only, not the first of many. So when Jesus comes to us and says, follow me, 
The difference between believing that Jesus Christ is your Savior and being a disciple of Jesus Christ is when you answer the call to follow Jesus, you're all in. It's the full weight, and there is no other. So the scripture today is from Matthew 8. Let me put it in context. If you're with us in, uh, in February, you heard me, I did three sermons. I have to go to the Holy Land, Nazareth, Capernaum, Jerusalem. If you notice, the scripture starts out today in Matthew 8. As we entered, remember, did you notice? Capernaum, thank you. You're, you're, you're making the connection. That's good, that's good. You're making a connection. The Advent in Capernaum. So let me, just, let me just put you right there in Capernaum and how Jesus got to Capernaum if you missed February. So Jesus was in Bethlehem. Uh, they went to Egypt to escape Herod. Then they went to Nazareth, and Jesus was raised in the town of Nazareth. And he stayed there until uh, he was an adult, and he proclaimed the prophecy of the Messiah had been fulfilled. And this is how he did it. He went to the, he went to the temple. Uh, I'm sorry, he went to the synagogue in Nazareth. They handed him the scroll of Isaiah. He turned it to Isaiah 61. He read the prophecy of the Messiah. He handed it back and he said, Today, this prophecy has been fulfilled in your hearing. He had just proclaimed himself the Messiah in Nazareth. And their response was uh, quite dramatic. And so they the intention to take Jesus and point him over to us. That was what they were going to do. But instead, Jesus escaped, he left Nazareth, and he went to the town of Capernaum. And that is where he made his home. So he lived in Capernaum. And when he was in Capernaum, as we get into Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, he begins to call disciples. Peter, Andrew, follow me. James, John, leave your net. I will make you fishers of people. Follow me. And so he began to have his followers, and things started to happen. So that's Matthew 4. And then Matthew 5, what, what, what the, the thing in Matthew 5 is, there's about 5,000 people who have heard of Jesus, who have come to hear his teaching, so his reputation is growing. People want to hear, and they're going to come test him out is what they're doing. I want to see what this guy has to say. I, I heard what happened in Nazareth. Or I heard he healed this one certain person. I'm going to come check out this Jesus and see if he's for real. And there were so many people in the town of Capernaum couldn't even hold it. So Jesus said, hey, let's go up on the mountain right here next to town. What we call today the Mount of Beatitudes. The Beatitudes is the first part of the Sermon on the Mount. So he goes up the mountain, he teaches all the 5,000 people, he teaches them the Beatitudes. Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 records that message. And so they, they have the sermon, everybody's happy, they're all testing them out, maybe a few people believe. He comes back down the mountain, chapter 8, and he enters Capernaum. And he's immediately met by a centurion. Now, the centurion is a Roman soldier, kind of like the police at the time. Now, first, it's hard enough to be a police in our a police officer in our area, because when you're a police officer in our area, at least you have the support of most of the people. I mean, most of us appreciate the police protecting us and serving us. There are a few people who do not appreciate the police because they're doing things they probably shouldn't be doing. But in first century Israel, the police were the Roman soldiers. And no one wanted them there. Even if they're protecting, even if they're serving, no one wanted them. The Jewish people did not want the Roman soldiers there. The centurion is an officer, a police officer, Roman soldier, in charge of a hundred people, a hundred men. Now, put in perspective, What's the Roman centurion probably feel about his position? Well, he's an important person. He's a citizen of Rome. He's in charge of 100 people. He's got a lot of responsibility. He's in charge of this territory of Galilee. But he's also, more than likely, very far from home in the place that he would least likely be. So it's just a bad combination. You've got a bunch of Roman soldiers acting as police in a place they don't want to be among the people with, with a bunch of people that don't want them there. 
Mm. But there's a situation that's going on that changes the perspective. And the situation is the centurion has a Roman soldier, has a Roman soldier, has a servant who he loves dearly, who is suffering terribly. And maybe, you know, we don't know what happened up until Romans 8. We don't know if he was like trying out this chair and that chair, or maybe he came over to, to this, and maybe he's trying out that and he wasn't finding anything. But, he, but when he came to Jesus, when he decided to come to Jesus, <laughs> it was dramatic. You don't feel it just reading it in Matthew 8. But a centurion officer, a Roman officer, humbled himself before a Jewish rabbi, a group of people they despised, and came to him and said, My servant is sick. He's suffering terribly. And Jesus asked, Would you like, not, not assuming, would you like for me to come to your house? And heal him. And the Roman centurion responded, I do not deserve to have someone as worthy of you as you come into my house. All of that is really cool. But then I want you to understand the significance of Jesus' response. Jesus said, of all the people in Israel, I've never seen anyone with greater faith than this man right here. So what makes his faith so great? First, he humbled himself. He had to humble himself. He had to remove himself from the position that he had of authority as a centurion, as a major police officer in the area. He had to humble himself and come to a man who he had, was putting his trust in at that moment. And he wasn't just trusting out Jesus. He was putting his full trust in Jesus at that moment. And then he said something really amazing. He says, Jesus, I'm not worthy for you to be in my house. All you have to do, Jesus, if you just say the word, if you just say the word, if you say it, it will happen. You see, I'm, I'm a man of authority. And if I tell a soldier, come, he comes. If I tell a soldier, go, he goes. If I tell my servant, do this, do this. I trust in your word. I trust that you have the authority. I trust in your power. So, he put his full weight on that moment in Jesus. But he didn't do it like this. And I imagine if I'm going to use the tool as a prop, if I imagine coming to Jesus at that moment, it would be more like putting your full weight like this. Kind of like jumping out of an airplane without a parachute. I don't know where you are in your faith. I don't know if you're, you're a tester. I don't know if you're looking for a stool. Here's one. I don't know if you, you believe that you haven't put your full weight on Jesus. I don't know if you're living your life half cheeking it or just doing it on Sunday morning while you're checking out the other stools during the week. I don't know if you've done your, your full weight. Maybe you're there. Maybe you're there. But there are times you walk away from it, too. There's one more level of the discipleship pathway that's identified in the Bible. There's one more thing after putting your full weight and trust in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And the next level is the willingness, what the Apostle Paul talks about, to be an ambassador for Christ. So that this full weight you put on this faith of Jesus Christ, you're willing to share. So that others might begin to trust in Jesus fully as well. So today we come to the understanding, the honesty of where you are on your faith journey, and maybe where you need to be, or where you want to be. And if you're still testing, this is a great place to be. If you're not seeking it, this is a great place to be. 
But if you're ready to put your full weight on your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and hear the invitation to follow me, today's a great place, a great place to start, and this is a great place to do it. And no matter where you are in your journey, there's always a way to be more like Jesus. And one of the pieces I want to share with you. Last week we put names on papers and we put them in these walls. These walls uh, for us represented, represented the wall in Jerusalem because when I was in Jerusalem I put names, I put prayers on the walls in Jerusalem. People from all over the world do that. And so last week you responded. Those of you who are here, you, I asked you to, to write names of people who did not know Jesus. Names of people that now we can call you know, explorers and seekers. Maybe people are running away from God. And put, put their names here and, uh, and to be committed to praying for those folks. And I want to show you the results of that over three services last week. These represent the prayers of you, the prayers of the people. So I, I found out in Jerusalem because the wall is huge, but eventually, after thousands of people put the prayers in the crevices of those rocks, it gets full. And I found out what they do is the, the, the rabbis in Jerusalem take out all the prayers, and they, they put them together, and they put them in a container, and they treat them as holy. These are holy prayers to God. And so we will continue to lift up these people, because the reason we exist as Wesley Chapel, is to make disciples. Not just believers, but to make faithful followers of Jesus Christ. And so we continue to pray for these people as we continue to pray for one another to be a godly people. Let us pray. Most holy God, you know the heart of each and every person here. And some of us, Lord, we're, we're seeking... Some of us are exploring and testing and trying to figure out if this is for real. Some of us are believing, but we haven't heard the call to follow. So, Lord, I, I pray today that if there's anybody in that situation that has not put their full weight in you, that they do that today. This will be the day. For that. And Lord, for those who have put their full weight in you, Lord, may we maintain that position. May we not look away or side to side or revert back to old ways or look for new ways that are not consistent with your will. So we can put a full weight in you. And Lord, continue to strengthen our faith by the power of the Holy Spirit. May we be your ambassadors share with the world that's broken and hurting and hungry for something to believe in and something to trust. Just share with them how trustworthy you are. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Lord and Savior. Amen.